number 10 spot, we have Miss Louise. Miss Louise was an older patient in an asylum who would often sleep talk, but this wasn't your ordinary sleep talking. Her eyes would every so often open, and sometimes she would be sitting up. Oh, terrifying. She wouldn't remember anything that happened when she awoke, which made witnessing her even creepier. Apparently, she has spoken about people who were once there, including a guy who had passed away and a girl that hangs around her and her dead husband who is always looking out for her. One of the nurses recalled a time when Miss Louise was sleep talking and she heard her saying, shh, better not talk too loudly. They're all sleeping. Let's talk about it later. Wild and creepy and cool at the same time. Coming up at our number nine spot, we have Possessed Jane. There was once a woman named Jane who lived at a facility. On her first night at the facility, she was found in a pile of blood. Apparently, she had been cutting her skin around her shin with her fingernails and was pulling her skin up her leg. Ah, I may be sick. Apparently, she had a very methodical approach to her nighttime routine going every night to each corner of her room and drawing the cross on the walls. Apparently, one night, Jane was screaming late into the night, and when the night nurse went to ask her what was wrong, she responded, what makes you think you are speaking to Jane? <laughs> Creepy. In our number eight spot, we have the CIA test patient. Apparently, the person who is telling this story once had a very long conversation with a man from a mental facility, and this man claimed that the CIA was beaming thoughts into his head. Apparently, even though this seems like a crazy thought, he made a very interesting point. The man said that if the CIA were going to test products that could send ideas or thoughts into another person's head, of course they're going to use the people that the public already deems as crazy. Then no one would believe them even if they mentioned it. Not to mention they're already confined and being observed. They therefore make the best test subjects. Yeah. Whoa, that's such a good point. In our number seven spot, we have the patient with the teddy bears. There was once a patient that had a collection of teddy bears. He was a young man and he just loved his teddy bears. It seemed to be completely harmless. Until one day a nurse walked into his room only to find him sitting cross-legged on the floor and all of the bears facing her. The man creepily smiled at her and said, their bears are going to eat you. And it's as if there was an echo in the room because he kept saying to her, eat you, eat you eat you, until she got so creeped out that she closed the door and got her co-worker to take over. Apparently, the co-worker went into the room to find the man sleeping. Okay, so he was obviously possessed. I may not sleep tonight thinking about this man saying eat you over and over again. <laughs> In our number six spot, we have the writings on the bed. This is a story told from the perspective of a nurse that worked on this ward, and he was approached by one of his patients, and she said that she found writings under her bed. Apparently, the bed beds in this ward were held by small wooden bed frames, so someone could have definitely crafted a message on the wood. The nurse wondered what the patient was doing under the bed in the first place, but attested it to something strange and abnormal that he would usually see on this floor. Anyways, one day he went to the patient's room and she showed him the writings and sure enough, they were there. There were stories written on the wood. After this, somebody went to check all of the beds and apparently they all had writings on them. Plans of people taking their own lives stories of their daily life and who the bad nurses were. It really creeped the nurse out. Honestly, I probably would have written under the bed as well. <laughs> I remember I did that once when I was young with an old coffee table my family had. It was like a diary after some time had passed, so yeah, I was a special child. <laughs> in our number five spot, we have the Stephen King man. There was once a patient who was in a ward, but also had been struggling with a few other health problems, so he was attached to an oxygen tank, an IV, and a heart monitor. This guy apparently acted as if he was in a Stephen King novel. The volunteer that was working there was sitting with a few patients, including this guy, and this guy mistakenly thought that he was a psychiatrist, probably because he was holding a clipboard. Anyways, the patient started talking to him and asking for his opinion, and the volunteer just kept turning it around onto him and asking him what he thought about it. That kind of reminds me of Jamie Lee Curtis in Freaky Friday. And how do you feel about that? Anyways, this seemingly worked until the patient looked at him and said, quote, you can be the next messiah. 
come here and let me teach you. He insisted that the volunteer sit beside him, but of course he refused and said, that's okay. Eventually the patient said, I see. And he began to take off his oxygen mask, his heart monitor, and detach the IV. The volunteer asked him why he was doing this, and the patient said, I can go now, my task is complete. You will not accept my teaching, and now I can die in peace knowing I tried. A nurse then showed up, and the volunteer quickly made his exit. I hope he updated the nurse, because that sounds pretty scary, and I hope that patient is all right. In our number four spot, we have Laughing John. This is a story that is actually told by someone who was once a patient in a psych ward. She was very familiar with the other people staying there, including a man named John. One day she was walking along the corridor when she heard John making really weird noises, laughing and talking to someone in the bathroom with him. She said she waited for him to leave for about 20 minutes and the noises kept getting louder and louder, so she decided to do something. She opened the door to the bathroom, as they usually aren't locked here, and she saw John on the floor laughing naked, covered in a pool of blood. He had broken a mirror and had begun to carve deep gashes in his arms and legs. She thought, you know, he was going to die. So she rushed in to help him when he took the mirror shard and sliced her up with it. Her screams are what alerted the staff to come in and restrain him. Apparently days later, she saw him and he had no recollection of the incident. Horrifying. In our number three spot, we have have the Air Force pilot. This guy, who was newly admitted into a ward, spoke to one of the nurses about his past experiences. He mentioned that he was once a pilot for the Air Force and he flew experimental planes because his blood was a bit abnormal and could withstand the G-force. Anyways, testing was done that proved this part of the story to be true as his blood was naturally thin. So. Anyways, the nurse was at her desk relaying this story to another nurse when a resident started questioning her about it. Apparently, he used to be an Air Force pilot, and the place that this patient was referring to is a top secret place where there are no roads coming in or out of it. It's so secret that you wouldn't know about it unless you've gone there, and that she should not talk about it as she could get herself into trouble. Does that mean I should not talk about it now? Oh well, too late. In any case, I wonder if some experiments were done on this guy and that's why he needed psychiatric help. Crazy to think about what we don't know that might be happening in this world. In our number two spot, we have the talking old lady. This is another story told by a patient who was once in a ward. She said that there was once an old lady that was right beside her room, and this old lady was constantly talking to her dead daughter. Ah, oh, that's so sad. The older woman would seemingly be comforting her daughter and telling her how much she loved her, until one day something happened and the relationship seemingly took a turn. The old woman got super angry with her and started blaming her for everything, including for why her porridge was burnt, to making her live in such an uncomfortable place. The woman began crying all the time and it was just horrible. The patient asked to change rooms because it was just too dark and sad to hear every single day. So understandable. In our number one spot, we have patients predict their own deaths. This is a story told by a nurse that specialized in geriatrics, and apparently she worked for several hospitals for many, many years. She would often talk about situations that would happen at her work. She would say that each of her patients weirdly tended to have a similar checklist that they would follow right before they were about to die. They would always die in a very similar way. They would talk to someone that wasn't there, usually a previous loved one that had passed away, and when they were asked about what they were talking about, they would say that they were told that they're ready to move on and that they will be taken the next day at a very specific time. Apparently, the patients would often die at the exact time their loved ones had said that they would. In our number 10 spot, we have the aggressive girl. When this storyteller was younger, she was put into a psych ward after threatening to take her own life. She had only been in there one day before this incident happened. She was sitting on her bed just reading when all of a sudden she heard screaming in the halls. Then less than a minute later, a girl in her 20s or so kicked down her door 
and was just staring at her with a devilish look and a sharp object in her hand. The storyteller sat there frozen looking at the girl when all of a sudden two bodyguards tackled the devilish girl to the ground. The girl was then dragged away and put into the quiet room. When the doctor came in, they told the patient that all was well and asked her if she wanted to still take her own life. The girl said, nope, and she was then released one day later. In our number nine spot, we have no friends. When this storyteller was a med student and he was shadowing a resident and doing psych clerkship, he came across a patient who had been struggling with schizophrenia and with hearing voices in his head. The resident he was shadowing asked him what the voices would say to him and he didn't want to answer the question. Apparently he was then offered some meds to make the voices go away and he didn't want to take them. When the resident asked him why he didn't want to take them, he replied that they were his only friends. In our number eight spot, we have the lollipop. This is a story told by a nurse that worked in a ward and was being informed about a new patient that had been checked in. This is a patient that was being treated for many problems, but learning about his history really freaked her out. Apparently, one day he wanted a lollipop from his mom and she wouldn't give him one. So he decided to purposely drown his toddler brother because she refused. When the nurse got a good look at the patient, she said it was like there was no life behind his eyes. He was stark, cold, and terrifying. No humanity was left. In our number seven spot, we have cat sounds. This is a story about a guy who was working as a nurse on a ward when he got talking to one of the patients that he was taking care of. The patient was talking to him about why he was in there and proceeded to tell the nurse that he beat up his cat and it got very injured. When the nurse asked him why he beat up his cat, the guy said that he liked the noises his cat made as he punched him, oh gosh. In our number six spot we have Baby Doll. This story is told by a nursing assistant that would assist a sweet old lady with dementia in one of the wards. She had other psychological issues too, so that's why she was in there. This old woman believed herself to be a mother and she had a baby doll that she would hold and, and believe it to be her child. And each night, the nursing assistant would watch her tuck the baby in. She had her own little bed for the baby. She would also think herself to be pregnant at times and when the baby was was due and she wouldn't have the baby, she would get depressed and angry for about a month until she thought herself to be pregnant again. One night, the nursing assistant saw that she had forgotten to tuck her baby in and so he said that he would help her. The woman punched the assistant right in the throat and he fell to the floor gasping for air when the woman continued to hit him and say that he was driving too fast and that he destroyed everything she loves. Later on after this incident, the assistant discovered that the woman had once lost her one-year-old and husband in a car accident when she was pregnant and she was so distraught that she ended up giving her baby up for adoption. The assistant felt that it was as if she was in her own personal hell reliving those memories over and over again. So sad. In our number five spot, we have the chemically induced psychosis. This was a story told by a ward assistant that came across a young man who was suffering from an illicit substance induced psychosis. This patient was taken to this hospital and had been there for over a month with no signs of remission. He had all of the psychotic behaviors while he was in there. But what was horrific to witness was the moments when he would come out of it and popped into reality. He would have a look of sheer terror and his shaky voice always stuck in this assistant's mind. His family would be so sad and have a hard time visiting him when they did. I really can't imagine how this family must have felt to have to witness this. It's truly very haunting. In our number four spot, we have a handful of daisies. This is the story of a woman who was a patient at a ward as she was suffering from psychosis for many, many years. When she was young, she witnessed the brutal killing of her mother. Apparently, she went missing for a few days and was found completely distraught. Her psychosis got worse over the years and she would yell and scream the most horrific, sad things every so often. She did have a lot of good days though where she would be pretty lucid and she would take a cab to town when all of the staff was distracted with lunch, she would buy herself a handful of daisies and then take a cab back. The staff would be frantically looking for her, of course, when an angry cab driver would pull up demanding to be paid. In our number three spot, we have the 
Red Shirt Man. This story is told by a nurse assistant who was working in a psych ward and was introduced to a very ill man with psychosis. The man was wearing a bright red shirt and looked disheveled. In minutes of meeting him, he had shouted all kinds of profanity at him. He was told to be weary of him. One day he was given the task to check up on him and drop off some food for him. He was reluctant to do so as most of the staff were afraid of this guy as he was quite often very aggressive. When he approached his room, he knocked and asked him if he could come in. Silence. He knocked again and still silence. So he announced that he was coming in regardless. He opened the door to find the man sitting on his bed, cross-legged, wearing his red shirt again and staring at him with blood running down his nose. He must have hit himself or had done something to injure himself. When the assistant asked if he needed any help, the patient threatened to kill him and said his deceased father was going to help him. He quickly left the room and closed the door and asked to never see that patient again. He was pretty sure that there was some kind of demon inside of him. In our number two spot, we have the nightly screams. This is a story about a mental asylum from the early 1900s. This story is told by a woman named Nellie who stayed in an asylum for 10 days undercover to see what the conditions were like. Apparently every night she experienced what the nurses called the nightly screams. Screams could be heard every night from some of the same rooms and some were different. Nellie reported that one night she heard a woman pray and beg for death, while on another night she heard a woman repeatedly shout, Kill. Well, that must have been horrific to witness. <laughs> in our number one spot, we have the Spanish demons. One night in a ward while on the night shift, a nurse heard a man freaking out. This man was from South America and he was known to speak in Spanish from time to time. On this night, he was screaming and yelling about demons coming to get him in Spanish. She tried to do what she could to calm him down but didn't have much luck until he just abruptly stopped screaming and went dead silent. He was looking at something behind the nurse, which completely freaked her out enough to look behind her, and of course, nothing was there. But he kept looking until she decided it was time to exit the room. She apparently didn't get much sleep that night, which makes sense, I don't think I would either. <laughs> Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Sue Lam Hospital. This hospital was built in 1972 and was designed to specialize in mental health treatments as well as physiotherapy. The designs for the building began in the 60s and the building was created with quite a few structural issues. There were often leaky roofs that led to infection control issues within the hospital, which is exactly the opposite of what you want to happen in a hospital. They were usually understaffed, which led to the patients being given extremely high doses of oral sedatives in order to keep all the patients calm and to avoid any violent outbursts. But of course, aside from the ethics of that practice, this would lead to substance dependence problems, which in turn led Led to more violent outbursts. There was a focus on security in this hospital, which could be a good thing, but it truly was taken overboard and it ended up being more like a prison, which is extremely detrimental to those who are trying to heal. In 2012, the original Sioux Lam building was abandoned and the hospital moved to a new location in Castle Peak. In our number nine spot today, we have the King Chung Psychiatric Rehabilitation Hospital. Before I dive into this one, guys, please don't forget to hit the thumbs up button if you're enjoying the video so far because it really helps us out. This hospital is located in Shanghai and has a lot of history of holding patients long past their recovery. The most well-known case of this is the case of Su Wei. In 2001, Su Wei began to exhibit some symptoms of mental illness and upon evaluation, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia. He was treated for a short while and then released back to his family. In 2003, Su got in an argument with his father and ended up hitting his father, which of course was not okay and his father ended up taking him to the King Chung Hospital. In 2008, Sue's father passed away, so his guardianship was passed on to his brother, and since that year, Sue has expressed his wishes to be released from the hospital, but his brother will not sign the discharge papers, so Sue was kept in the facility for years against his will. He was even declared rehabilitated, but they still would not let him leave, which I can only imagine took an enormous toll on his mental health that he had been working so hard on. In 2013, Sue finally got the assistance he needed from a lawyer and sued both his brother and the hospital, but after a year of delays, his case was rejected. Finally, after three more years of appeals, Sue was finally declared to have full civil capacity and was finally released. It is so sad that Sue was held for years against his will, all because of a mental illness that he took the steps to get under control, but I am so glad 
that he was able to recover and finally be released. In our number eight spot today, we have the Hadian District Mental Health Prevention and Treatment Hospital. This hospital is in the Hadian District, which is mostly in northwestern Beijing. Not a lot has come out about this treatment facility in terms of what goes on on a day-to-day -day basis, but there is a huge and important question that has to do with this facility. In 2012, China passed its first mental health law that aimed to prevent people from being involuntarily held at psychiatric facilities. Unfortunately though, this law still allows people to be sent in by their families and doesn't necessarily give them the ability to leave on their own free will, which seems like a huge oversight. In 2013, it was said that there were 300 in-house patients at the hospital. Out of the 300, apparently 150 of them met the medical requirements for discharge, but they weren't allowed to go home. It isn't exactly clear why, but it certainly is something to be looked into considering that is half of the people there. In our number seven spot today, we have the third hospital of Zhuzhou. The third hospital of Zhuzhou is of course located in Zhuzhou, which is in the Hunan province of China. I hope I said that right. This hospital tends to keep its inner workings secret, but there is one story that came out that definitely shocked a lot of people. In July of 2018, a woman named Dong Yao Chan live streamed a video of her throwing paint onto a billboard that depicted the Chinese leader Xi Jinping. In the video, she also accused the Chinese Communist Party authorities of thought control. Shortly after this video was streamed, Dong made a tweet that said that there were a bunch of uniformed people outside of her Shanghai home, then the account went totally silent. A year later, Dong's father finally gave an update and explained that his daughter had been taken into the third hospital of Zhuzhou's women's ward after the live stream, and she was just now being released. He expressed his concern over her heavy medication, and he described her after the release as lacking vitality. I, of course, am not a doctor, but Dong was being given antipsychotic drugs that are used to treat schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, despite not being being diagnosed with either, which just doesn't quite seem right. It is certainly worrisome that she was taken and treated and medicated at the hospital for an entire year, despite not being admitted either voluntarily or even by family. In our number six spot today, we have the Chaoyang District Mental Health Service Center. The Chaoyang District Mental Health Service Center is certainly one of the better ones on today's list, which may be in part due to the fact that it is privately owned. The center is located on the outskirts of Beijing and it provides services as well as housing for those who are mentally ill. The center originally opened in 1999 and has been growing and increasing its numbers of residents since then. Two thirds of the people at this facility only reside here because their family have either become overwhelmed with their care or they simply have just given up on them which is very sad. Because of the fact that this center is private, it also lacks a lot of funding, so it does not include a lot of necessary and beneficial services, such as counseling. The center mainly acts as housing, which is of course very important, and they are able to give out medication. With more funding, they would certainly be able to provide more care and services to the residents, as well as be able to expand their capacity. In our number five spot today, we have the Fujo Psychiatric Sanatorium. The Fujo Psychiatric Sanatorium has a very similar issue to the Hadian District Mental Health Prevention and Treatment Hospital that we talked about before. With the China mental health law overlooking the fact that patients should be allowed to leave on their own free will, it is extremely difficult to be discharged from this hospital without a family member consenting to it. At least half of the patients in this sanatorium have been able to recover and meet the requirements needed in order to be sent home, but their family or those who have, for some reason, been deemed necessary to look after the patients after their discharge are not willing to authorize these patients' release from the hospital. If someone is meeting all of the necessary requirements, it seems pretty unfair that the fate of their life would be left up to someone else, especially since there is seemingly no reason for them to continue living in a mental health facility. I can't imagine how being held captive would affect your mental health, especially when it's something you've already struggled with. And in our number four spot today, we have the Wenzhou of Conning Hospital. The Wenzhou of Conning Hospital seems to not necessarily be a hospital that is actively doing some questionable things, as far as I know, but because of the way mental health and mental illness are sometimes viewed in China, it is facing a bit of a dark issue. The director of the hospital has explained that over half of the patient's relatives are reluctant to take them home once treatment has been completed. This is a huge problem because these people will just be forced to stay in the care that they know 
no longer need and they are lacking the option to have autonomy over their own choices. I honestly am unsure if the hospital has to release patients to family members or if it has just been so customary to do so that there is a fear of letting patients leave on their own accord. Whichever it is, it certainly seems like it might be time for something to change. In our number three spot today, we have the High Street Community Center. The High Street Community Center is located in Hong Kong and was home to some extremely gruesome acts and is said to be very haunted. The building was created in 1892 and was originally used as the quarters for the European nursing staff by the civil hospital, but once World War II rolled around, this was the site where a lot of rebellious locals were tortured and executed by soldiers. After the war, this building became a mental hospital and was the only one of its kind at the time. In 1961, the hospital turned into a day treatment center for psychiatric outpatients until 1971. For the next 20 years, the building was abandoned, but that of course didn't stop trespassers, which led to all of the ghost stories being spread. Even if you don't believe in ghosts, just knowing the horrors that the building had seen would be enough to give you an eerie feeling. But for those who do believe, it is said that a woman can be heard crying, you can hear mysterious footsteps in the distance, but some people have even said that they've actually seen a headless ghost, and others say that they've witnessed a ghost burst into flames. All in all, I think this might be one building I just like to stay away from. In our number two spot today, we have the fourth hospital of Lin Yi. The fourth hospital of Lin Yi is a mental hospital located in Lin Yi, which is in the Shandong province of China. There is one major problem going on at this hospital, and that has to do with the hospital's deputy chief, Yang Yongshin. Yang is a clinical psychiatrist best known for his practice of electroconvulsive therapy without the use of any anesthesia or muscle relaxants. He claims his practices can help cure adolescents of internet addictions, and he unfortunately runs the internet addiction treatment center at the hospital. Yang's treatments would cost families around 800 US dollars a month and would combine this electroconvulsive therapy with psychiatric medication, which was eventually dubbed the brain waking treatment. Eventually, the Chinese Ministry of Health banned this treatment, which seems like the right thing to do, but now the doctor uses a new treatment that he came up with called low-frequency pulse therapy that his patients have said is much more painful than his previous treatment. Yang continues to be an extremely controversial psychiatrist, with people dubbing him as the devil still at large. One random but interesting fact I found while researching for this video, if you are a fan of the game Dead by Daylight, you might know the doctor character, and apparently this character, whose power is shocking the survivors, which alters their minds, is actually modeled after Yang. I'm not 100% sure if that is true, but I read about it and I just had to include it in this video because I wanted you guys to know that fact with me. Well, it's maybe not a fact. <laughs> In our number one spot today, we have the Beijing Anqing Hospital. The Beijing Anqing Hospital is of course located in Beijing in the Fangshan district, but it is truly more of a prison hospital than just a hospital. The word Anqing means peace and health, more specifically for the mentally ill, and while not all Anqing hospitals are like prisons, unfortunately this one kind of is. The Beijing Anqing is under the control of the Public Security Bureau, and a man named Wang Wangxing has spoken out about his treatment there. Wang is a political activist who was arrested on June 4th, 1992 for unfurling a banner in Tiananmen Square on the third anniversaries of the protests that happened there. After his arrest, he was quickly sent to the psychiatric hospital and suddenly diagnosed with political monomania. He spent 13 years trapped in this facility, and after his release, he details being forced to take the psychoactive drug chlorpromazine three times a day. He discussed having to share cells with mentally ill patients that had extensive violent records and who really frightened him, as well as the severe understaffing of the hospital, leaving two nurses in charge of 70 patients. There are reports of patients at the hospital passing away from abuse endured during their time there, from both nurses as well as other violent patients. Wang actually witnessed two deaths. 
one from a heart attack brought on by an electric acupuncture treatment, and the other was on a hunger strike and passed away while being force-fed by other inmates. Safe to say this place was absolutely terrifying to be held captive. In 1999, Wang was actually discharged on the condition that he didn't have any contact with the media. He asked if he would be allowed to have a press conference to discuss his confinement, and shortly after asking, he was removed from his home by eight public service officers and forced placed back into the hospital. In 2005, he was finally released and unexpectedly deported to Germany. Upon examination by two separate doctors in 2006, neither doctor found any symptoms that he was suffering from any mental illness that would justify his forceful admission to the hospital. Starting off this countdown, we have the Danvers Lunatic Asylum. This asylum opened in 1878 in Danvers, Massachusetts. It was part prison and part asylum. At its peak, it had 40 buildings, but could only hold 450 patients. But over time, the asylum started accepting more patients than it could handle. At one point, they had over 2,000 patients. But remember, they could only handle 450. So they were severely understaffed and the building was overcrowded. At this point, those at the hospital weren't getting cured. In fact, they were getting worse and worse. In 1939, a total of 278 patients died in the hospital, all from overcrowding. In fact, half the time, patients' dead bodies weren't discovered until days or weeks later. And if that wasn't bad enough, Danvers used to be Salem Village. Ever heard of the Salem Witch Trials? Yeah, a lot of people died on those grounds. Coming in at number nine, we have Alton Mental Health Hospital. Located in Illinois, this facility was built in the early 1900s. Sadly, they used a lot of unethical practices on the patients there, like electric shock therapy, lobotomies, and cold water treatments. This was just an everyday, normal practice at the hospital. Now it's said that this place is extremely haunted. It's still open to this day, and staff, patients, and visitors have all heard unexplainable noises, or doors will just randomly slam closed. One of the creepiest things that happened was to a nurse that worked at the hospital. She was in a room when she heard someone say, who's that? She turned around, but no one was there. Then that same day, a different nurse went into the same room, and she heard someone say the exact same thing. Lastly, a bunch of people have taken photos while visiting patients and have caught images and have caught orbs in their photos. One said the orb had a face of a human man in pain. In our eighth spot, we have the Trans Algany Lunatic Asylum. The Trans Algany Lunatic Asylum began operating in 1964 and was designed to hold only 250 patients. However, it was soon housing more than 2,400 patients which was very problematic. The place was extremely overcrowded and patients started to become more and more violent. Soon they were starting fires and attacking the staff. At one point, patients were locked in cages or chained up to things like animals. On top of that, some were lobotomized with ice picks. Needless to say, hundreds died there. And guess who was a patient there? None other than Charles Manson. In 1994, the asylum was forced to close due to a lot of violations. Now it's said that the building is haunted by the souls of mistreated patients. Moving on to number seven, we have Waverly Hills Sanatoria. Located in Kentucky, this hospital was originally built in 1910 as a hospital for patients with tuberculosis. Sadly, tons of patients there ended up dying from the disease. The hospital did more harm than good. Rumor goes that the hospital was mistreating their patients and conducting experiments on them. It's said that 63,000 deaths took place there. In fact, they had an area in the hospital called the death tunnel or body chute where they would dump the deceased. It's also said that one nurse hung herself in room 502. And in that same room, another nurse died from falling out of the window. Spooky. The hospital closed in 1961 upon the discovery of an antibiotic that could treat and cure tuberculosis. As a result, there was no need for that hospital. Coming in at number six, we have Creedmoor Psychiatric Hospital. Located in Queens, New York, the Creedmoor Psychiatric Hospital opened in 1912, and it's still open to this day, but it doesn't have the best reputation. In the 1970s, rumors began circulating about patients being mistreated there. They thought they could beat the bad out of the patients. 
In fact, it's said that one nurse hit a patient in a straitjacket across the throat with a club, which ended up crushing his throat and he died from asphyxiation. Shortly after, the asylum was closed and some areas were left to rot. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with Fairfield Hills State Hospital. Located in Newtown, Connecticut, this hospital opened in 1931 to help two overpopulated mental hospitals in the same area. But surprise, surprise, this hospital quickly became overcrowded as well. And so they turned to unethical ways to cure their patients such as lobotomies and hydrotherapy, except they would submerge the patients in ice water, sometimes for more than a day, and they weren't allowed to leave. No, not even if they had to go to the bathroom, they were just stuck there. Needless to say, that made everything worse. Now it's rumored that this hospital is haunted, especially in the tunnels where they used to shuttle patients, the alive ones and the dead ones. In our fourth spot, we have Willard Asylum for the Chronic Insane. This is considered one of the darkest places in America. So it all started back in the early 19th century. Those who didn't have anyone to look after them or those that couldn't look after themselves were left in shelters. And the shelters were becoming more and more crowded. In response, they opened up this hospital for them. The first patient they ever received was an elderly woman named Mary Rote, who was suffering from dementia. As a result, she spent 10 years chained to her bed. Another patient was a young girl who arrived at the hospital in a chicken crate. The hospital soon became a dumping ground for the undesirable. Sadly, a lot of patients did end up dying there. And they were buried on the grounds in graves marked by numbers, not names. In 1995, when the building closed, Workers discovered hundreds of suitcases in the attic of the building. These suitcases belonged to the patients who one day hoped for freedom, but never got it. Coming in at number three, we have the New Jersey State Lunatic Asylum. This asylum opened up in 1848 under the order of Dr. Henry Cotton, a man who thought mental illness was a result of body infections, which clearly isn't the case. So this belief led to a number of disturbing operations. He would do things like remove patients' teeth, stomachs, ovaries, colons, and bladders. All because he thought that if he removed them, he would just remove the mental health issues they had. But instead, he ended up killing a lot of the patients. Moving on to number two, we have Penhurst Asylum. This asylum opened in 1908 and was meant for people with mental and physical disabilities. But soon, they expanded and opened their doors to orphans, criminals, and people that just didn't have a place to go. But, of course, this led to overcrowding, and it seemed as if the hospital wasn't run in the best manner. If you went there, you were classified as either an imbecile or insane. They truly didn't know how to help patients with mental illnesses. A lot of patients were just strapped to their bed. In fact, one nurse admitted that there was one patient who was bullying others. So what did she do? She asked a doctor what she could inject him with that would cause him the most pain. And that's exactly what she did. She injected him with something and left him to suffer. Not only that, one patient was interviewed and asked what he would like most in the world. He said to get out of Penhurst. Thankfully, it shut its doors in 1987. At number nine is the Riverview Hospital in British Columbia, Canada. Woohoo, Canada. Venturing into the heart of British Columbia, we find the enigmatic Riverview Hospital, once a bustling mental asylum, now lost to time. This asylum site sprawls across 247 acres, harboring the echoes of a harrowing history. Dating back to the early 1900s, Riverview's West Lawn Pavilion stands as a sentinel to the past, housing profoundly disturbed male patients until its closure in 1983. Its grandeur with imposing pillars and weathered porch has made it an iconic image of the abandoned complex. Originally designed as a dual haven, the hospital aimed to merge healthcare with botanical splendor. A belief in nature's power to heal was ingrained in this foundation. However, its vision was shifted and Riverview's role as botanical sanctuary was eventually relocated. Within its walls, over 4,300 souls were held in the 1950s. But even as medical progress reduced patient numbers, troubling practices persisted. Shock therapy and alleged illegal sterilizations cast a chilling shadow with settlements granted to those who suffered in silence. Today, Riverview's eerie corridors whisper stories of trauma, rumors 
it to be a magnet for the supernatural. From its unsettling history to its role as a cinematic backdrop, the Riverview Hospital stands out as a silent sentinel, a portal to the past that still echoes in the present. At number 8 is San Antonio Duran, located in Cartago. Founded in 1918 and originally established as a tuberculosis hospital by Dr. Carlos Duran, the facility's purpose shifted over time. Despite contrasting accounts, it's confirmed that the doctor's daughter fell victim to the disease after the sanatorium's establishment. Tragically, her demise followed soon after. Operated predominantly by nuns from the sisters' charity Santa Ana, Santorio Duran expanded its scope to accommodate patients with varying conditions, including mental illness. The hospital's role extended beyond healthcare, often becoming an unconventional refuge for society's undesirables, where tuberculosis patients, individuals with mental struggles, and even criminals coexisted. Progress in tuberculosis treatment led to reduced patient numbers by 1960s, with those with mental illnesses transferred to larger psychiatric institutions. As the need for the sanatorium waned, it underwent transformations into an orphanage and a prison, persisting for another decade before its ultimate closure. Decades later, the site bears the marks of time and natural disaster, notably the eruption of the Irazu volcano in 1994. Today, this asylum stands as an eerie testament to its past, earning a reputation as one of Costa Rica's most haunted places. At number 7 is Denbig, the abandoned insane asylum in North Wales. Built between 1944 and 1948, Denbig was meant to be a sanctuary for around 200 patients from Wales. But as demand surged, it expanded its walls to contain up to a staggering 1,500 souls at its peak. Now things would eventually take a dark turn. We're talking prefrontal lobotomy. Over 20 unfortunate patients underwent this procedure between 1942 and 1944. Tragically, one even lost their life. Life. And if that wasn't grim enough, reports suggest that violent patients found themselves in cages. Flash forward to the 1960s and the asylum's infamy caught up with it. Enoch Powell, a British member of parliament, pulled the plug on Daneberg's operation. But it kept haunting until 1995, when its doors finally closed for good. At number 6 is the Hagerdon Psychiatric Hospital, nestled on Sanatorium Road in New Jersey, USA. Originally constructed in 1907 as a tuberculosis sanatorium, Hagedorn? Hagedorn? I don't really know. This place aimed to treat only the curable. Over the years, its mission expanded to include those deemed incurable, and by 1929, about 10,000 patients had sought care here. Fast forward to the 1970s, and the hospital fell into disrepair and was abandoned, and a new psychiatric facility was erected nearby. This extension catered to elderly patients with mental illnesses, but the winds of change blew strong. The shift away from institutionalization led to Hagerdon's official closure in 2012. Now abandoned, Hagerdon stands as a somber reminder of an era when care methods were vastly different. These silent corridors echo with the stories of those who live within, a testament to the progress we've made in mental health care. At number 5 is the Willard Asylum for the Chronically Insane in New York, USA. Built in 1869, this cutting-edge facility held a gymnasium, arts and crafts, a movie theater, and even a bowling alley aimed to provide a haven for those with mental illnesses to recover and reintegrate into society. But sadly, like its other counterparts, overcrowding stifled its mission, subjecting patients to archaic treatments like electroshock therapy and ice baths. The hospital's doors closed in 1995, but its legacy lives on through the haunting discovery of hundreds of suitcases belonging to forgotten patients. These personal artifacts tell the stories of lives once lost in the shadows, now brought to light by the Willard Suitcase Project. At number four, and I'm totally gonna butcher this, is the Ospedale Psichiatrico di Volterra, the abandoned insane asylum in Italy. Established in 1888, this asylum was meant to be a haven for patients with mental illnesses. Dr. Luigi Scabia expanded it into a village complete with shops, gardens, and even a judicial section. However, its idyllic vision was lost as it became overcrowded with over 6,000 patients by the year 1960. Sadly, conditions here were far from ideal. Patients were treated like prisoners, subjected to electroshock, insulin-induced comas, and ice tank submergents. The asylum's dark history persisted until 1978, when the Basaglia law mandated its closure, finally ending the suffering. Today, the abandoned asylum stands as a somber reminder of its past. Among the decaying walls, you can still find the haunting artwork of Fernando Orsete Nanetti, a patient who left his mark with intricate graffiti that depicted the experiences and abuses he witnessed. At number three is the trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum in West Virginia, USA. Opening its doors back in 1983, this asylum was the brainchild of Thomas Kirkbade, a mental health practitioner who believed in providing patients with a supportive environment for their recovery. Originally embodying reformist ideals, the asylum boasted spacious halls, private rooms, and even outdoor facilities like a farm and waterworks. But as time went on, a sinister shift occurred. Overcrowding took hold with patient numbers far exceeding capacity. Quality care plummeted, leaving patients to fend for themselves amidst the deteriorating conditions. What's truly disturbing, however, is the treatments administered here. Dr. Walter Freeman, 
Sweden, infamous for his ice pick lobotomy method, performed around 4,000 of these chilling procedures within these walls, which involved an ice pick through the eye socket. The horrors within these walls came to light in the bombshell expose in 1949, revealing the disturbing conditions. Yet the asylum staggered on, only closing its doors for good in 1994. Today, visitors can explore the remnants of its haunting history. The main building now hosts exhibits showcasing patient art and the tools of their torment. For those brave enough, paranormal tours await, offering a spine-chilling glimpse into the secrets that still echo within these forsaken halls. At number two is the Beechworth Lunatic Asylum in Victoria, Australia. Back in October of 1867, this sprawling institution emerged atop a hill, driven by a peculiar belief that a higher altitude could cure mental illness, housing over 1,200 patients and boasting a staff of 700 at its zenith. But the treatments here were anything but gentle. We're talking straitjackets, shackles, and electroshock therapy, a common practice that led to mass shock sessions. Now it's no wonder that this place was believed to be haunted even after its closure in 1995. For example, meet Martin Sharp, a compassionate soul from the past. Rumor has it that her spirit still lingers, casting chilling auras as she watches over patients. Nurses have shared eerie tales of her presence, recounting a sudden drop in temperature when she's around. And brace yourself, other ghostly figures have been sighted by brave visitors during haunted tours, preserving the asylum's unsettling legacy that endures even now, more than 150 years later. And number one is the State Asylum in Pennsylvania, USA, where healing turned into horror. Established in 1903 as a haven for the mentally ill, it quickly spiraled into overcrowded chaos. Unqualified staff struggled to care for patients, leading to shocking violence between them. In 1919, two staff members confessed to strangling a patient, yet they were bizarrely kept on staff. The violence continued with horrifying discoveries over the years. Unthinkable medical experiments also took place, reportedly by a pharmaceutical company. This this house of horrors finally came to light in a 1946 expose and was deemed a nightmare in the 1980s. And despite several closure attempts, the asylum's doors finally shut for good in 1990. Today it stands abandoned, a grim reminder of the darkness that once echoed within. Starting off this countdown, we have the teeth. The first patient on this list did something so gruesome to herself that you may just want to stop eating for a second while I tell the story. So according to the nurse that shared this story, this patient was known for inflicting harm on herself. She was known to rip out all of her hair till there was none left on her head or body. That was one of her habits. One day when they went to go check up on her, they found her with blood all over the floor and blood coming out of her mouth. The patient had pulled out most of her teeth, some of which she actually swallowed. The image of her just sitting in her room, bloody teeth surrounding her, has haunted the nurse ever since. Like, ow! And at number nine, we have the appetites. And guys, make sure to give this video a big thumbs up. Obviously, subscribe to our channel because you know what? It really helps us out. So this next patient was placed into a hospital after suffering severe brain damage. She was so bad that she would tend to eat anything around her. She has eaten styrofoam cups, plastic cutlery, plates, and even her clothes. As a result, she was kept in a padded cell with absolutely nothing in it, or else she would try to eat it. One night, though, she plucked out one of her eyes. When nurses found her, they wondered where the eye had went. But I'm sure you know where this is going. They later found that she had eaten her own eyeball. This isn't fake, guys. These are real stories. Coming in at number eight, we have Jane. According to this person that shared the story, Jane was a young lady that had a lot going on, but she wasn't diagnosed yet. The first night at the facility, the staff found Jane in her room in a puddle of blood. Turns out that Jane was picking at the skin on her legs. She managed to pull her skin up on her leg and was degloving her own calf. Jane also had other strange habits Every night before bed, she would perform the same ritual. She would run from wall to wall, touching them in a crucifix pattern. She would do this for hours before finally going to bed. But one night, a worker heard Jane screaming late at night. When he went to go check in on her, she was standing at the doorway smiling. When the staff said, Jane, what's wrong? She replied with, what makes you think you're speaking to Jane? Yeah, no, that's possession. Jane is gone. 
that's the devil you're talking to. In our seventh spot, we have the threat. Honestly, if I worked at any of these places, I don't think I would ever sleep again, especially after hearing this next story. So this next individual worked at a hospital, particularly with older patients. It was around 2.30 in the morning and the staff was going around making sure all the patients were still in their room sleeping. But when they approached the room of an 83 year old woman, they found her sitting straight up in her bed, just staring at the wall. They walked into the room and told her to lie back down and to go to sleep. Then she turned around and said, they're coming for you, dear. Then she started laughing, like she let out an evil cackle. Afterwards, she lied back down and said, I'm going to miss you when they take you. Yeah, I wouldn't sleep anymore if that happened to me. Sleep? Yeah, we don't know her. Moving on, number six, we have the photos. So this story was posted on Reddit by the user Ping. She told the story on behalf of her sister, who is the director of a psychiatric hospital. According to her sister, one of her patients would cut open her arms, legs, and torso. But wait. It gets worse. After doing so, she would take photos of her family and place them under her skin and then close the skin around it. I seriously don't know how the workers do it. Like I would be traumatized if I saw someone do that. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the biter. Reddit user Omni Kronos shared the story of one of her patients. So she worked at a juvenile psych unit and one of the patients she had was very suicidal and distraught. Because of this, she would tend to bite chunks of skin and flesh out of her own shoulder. She had to be placed in restraints and her head strapped back because of this. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Apparently, three years later, she was on a bus headed to an interview for a graduate psych program. While on the bus, she was approached by a nicely dressed girl. The girl asked her if she worked at a psych unit. She then went on to say that she was the girl that used to bite the skin off of her shoulders. She was doing completely fine now. Like, that's amazing. I'm so happy that the girl is doing fine. Also, it's pretty cool how they just randomly bumped into each other like three years later. In our fourth spot, we have the lost identity. This story starts off with a pretty dark backstory. So this next individual worked at the dental clinic of a psychiatric hospital. One of the patients that she will never forget is a man named Terry. Here's where it gets dark. When Terry was young, he witnessed his sister get killed by their stepfather. As soon as this happened, Terry took on the personality of his sister. He was 100% convinced that he was her. As a result, he would often dress like her. Even now, as a grown man, he would wear little girls clothing. He would also cut pictures out of little girls and attach them to a string in which he would wear around his neck like a necklace. Even though the pictures of the girls were random and from magazines, he was convinced that they were his friends. Terry was never violent at all. He was just simply a boy who saw a tragic death at a young age that literally broke him. And that makes me so sad. Poor Terry. Moving on to number three, we have the carvings in the wall. This next worker was in charge of keeping an eye on a group of certain patients. One of the patients was a pretty shy guy named Tom. He had trouble speaking, so he often would just not speak at all. He had been in the hospital for about a month now and would often keep to himself. What's weird is that he would often sleep on the floor under his bed. Nurses just assumed he might be frightened and that he felt safer sleeping under his bed. So they allowed him to do so. One morning though, the nurse went to check on Tom and found him staring at the wall. His hands were covered in blood. Some of his fingernails were missing. They removed Tom from his room and she inspected the room to see what went down. The nurse followed the trail of blood to under his bed. When she moved the bed, she was horrified at what she saw. Tom had carved a bunch of drawings into the wall with his fingernails. The drawings were satanic. The freakiest part? Tom had written, he's coming, on the wall, in his blood. Who's coming? The devil, clearly, so get out of there. In our second spot, we have the bones. Just when you thought this list couldn't get any darker, we got this story. Literally, I was scripting this while eating mac and cheese and wrong decision, stop eating. So this next patient had a tendency to harm himself. In particular, his habit was to break his own bones. Now, you would think that would be extremely painful, but for some reason, to him, it wasn't. In fact, he has broken his left arm more than three times over the years. Basically, as soon as it heals, he purposely breaks it again. And as a result, his left arm barely functions. When asked why he does this, he told the workers he loves the sounds of bones breaking. He also always has broken fingers and toes. He's just constantly snapping and breaking his bones. Now they have restrained him so that he can't harm himself. But still, I could never imagine breaking my own bones on purpose. It's like the scene in The Orphan when she like puts her arm in the ah! If you see the movie, you know what I'm talking about. And in our number one spot, we have the eyes. Again, if you're eating something, 
maybe just put your food away. Just wait until this video's done. Believe me, you won't have an appetite after this. So this story was told by a daughter whose mom worked at a neuropsychiatric ward. One night while she was doing the room checks, she came across a very horrific scene. She turned the corner and saw that a staff member was collapsed on the floor. She immediately started doing CPR and called for help. The staff member had suffered a heart attack after seeing what the patient had done. The patient, who suffered from severe postpartum psychiatric disorder, was just sitting on the floor with her own eyes in her hand. Yeah, she gouged out her own eyes and was just holding them. And while the mom was frantically trying to save her co-worker's life, the patient just sat there calmly, smiling, holding her eyes. Starting off this countdown, we have Rolling Hills Asylum. Established in 1827, the Rolling Hills Asylum was originally a working farm that was converted into a home for the less fortunate. Then it went on to be a place for widows, orphans, alcoholics, criminals, and individuals with mental illnesses. But it closed its doors in 1974. Apparently, it's said that over 1,700 people died there. Hundreds are currently buried all over the property in unmarked graves, which makes this place very, very haunted. Visitors claim to have heard screaming and doors slamming. Others have seen the apparition of Roy Cruz, a seven and a half foot tall man who died there in 1942. And the hospital even has something known as a shadow hallway. A hallway where you can see tons of ghostly apparitions. Moving on to number nine, we have Topeka State Hospital. The Topeka State Hospital, located in Kansas, operated from 1872 to 1997. And this hospital, much like the others on this list, has quite a dark history. So apparently in the early 20th century, a reporter visited the facility and witnessed some terrifying things. He said that he saw a patient that had been strapped down for so long that his skin was growing over the restraints. And there were other patients that were chained up like animals. But a majority of them just sat in the hallways on a rocking chair, rocking back and forth, staring at the walls all day. That's something straight out of a horror film. In our 8th spot, we have the trans Albany Lunatic Asylum. The trans Albany Lunatic Asylum began operating in 1964 and was designed to only hold 250 patients. However, it was soon housing more than 2,400 patients, which was very problematic. The place was extremely overcrowded and patients started to become more and more violent. Soon, they were starting fires and attacking the staff. In 1994, the asylum was forced to close due to a lot of violations. Now it's said that the building is haunted from the souls of the mistreated patients. In fact, the building is open to ghost tours if you want to go do some exploring. In our seventh spot, we have the Metropolitan State Hospital. Located in Massachusetts, this hospital opened in 1930 for patients with mental illnesses. But in 1980, something sinister happened that gave the hospital the nickname the Hospital of Seven Teeth. So back in 1978, a patient named Anna Marie Davy went out for a walk on the grounds, but she never returned. In 1980, the patient Melvin Wilson came forward saying that he had killed her and buried her body parts all around the grounds. Not only that, he kept seven of her teeth as souvenirs. Hence the nickname, the Hospital of Seven Teeth. But that's not the only bad thing to happen there. Years before this incident, in the 1960s, a bunch of patients were accidentally poisoned, but this has never been confirmed. In 1992, the hospital was closed after psychiatric care in Massachusetts became more privatized. In our sixth spot, we have Rancho Los Amigos. In 1888, Rancho Los Amigos, located close to downtown LA, was originally created to assist people living in poverty. Over time, the hospital expanded and was home to the elderly, homeless, and individuals with disabilities. But over the years, it ended up changing to become mainly a mental hospital. The hospital was in full operation until the 1950s, when it started to shut down its wards, including the mental hospital. That's when they discovered the hospital had a more dark past. In 2006, after the hospital was abandoned, a freezer was discovered in the morgue. Inside of it were mummified, amputated limbs and brain tissue samples. Guess they didn't want to take that with them. 
but this makes you wonder what really went down in this hospital. The original building is now abandoned, but it has moved to another location and is now called Rancho Los Amigos National Rehabilitation Center. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with Creedmoor Psychiatric Hospital. Back in 1912, this hospital opened up in Queens, New York for individuals that were said to be mentally ill. Most of the patients had psychosis or schizophrenia. It started off as a small institution with only 32 patients, but in 1959, it housed more than 7,000 patients. As a result, the hospital was very crowded and understaffed. In the 1970s, rumors spread like wildfire about murders, attacks, and suicides all happening in the hospital. In fact, it's said that one nurse hit a patient in a straitjacket across the throat with a club, which ended up crushing his throat and as a result he died from asphyxiation. Shortly after, the asylum was closed and left to rot. Making our way down the list number 4, we have the Ganjiam Psychiatric Hospital. This next abandoned hospital is named one of the most haunted places in South Korea and one of the freakiest places in the world. In fact, it's home to tons of urban legends. One legend states that the owner of the hospital was insane and kept the patients as his prisoners. Another version of the legend states that patients at the hospital started dying mysteriously and that's what forced the hospital to close. In reality, the hospital closed in the 90s due to unsanitary conditions and lack of funding. Apparently because of this, the owner left the country, leaving no documentation behind about this building so it was just abandoned. But to this day, people are convinced that the hospital is haunted. In fact, thousands of people break into the hospital each year just for the chance to catch a ghost. In our third spot, we have the Zelda Fitzgerald Sanatorium. Built in 1859, this sanatorium, once called Tioranda, was originally built for the Civil War officer, General Joseph Howland. Then in 1915, it was converted into a psychiatric hospital. In 1934, novelist F. Scott Fitzgerald took his wife Zelda there with hopes to cure her schizophrenia. Hence why people now refer to it as the Zelda Fitzgerald Sanatorium. However, it is probably most known for housing the patient Frances Seymour, aka actress Jane Fonda's mother. Frances ended up taking her own life there after cutting her throat with a razor in 1942. In 1999, the hospital closed and of course is now said to be haunted. In our second spot, we have Athens Lunatic Asylum. Yes, that's the actual name of this asylum. Located in Athens, Ohio, the asylum was built in 1874 for patients with tuberculosis. However, over the years, it became way too overcrowded and understaffed. As a result, patients were being mistreated. Over the years, the hospital turned into a place for the mentally ill. This is when the man, Dr. Walter Jackson, comes into play. Dr. Jackson loved transorbital lobotomies. He believed that it could cure all mental illnesses. So at this hospital, he performed 200 lobotomies. I'm telling you right now that many did not go so well. But that's not the only freaky thing to happen there. A patient known as Margaret Schilling went missing while in the ward. A month later, her body was found locked in a room in an abandoned section of a ward. In fact, her decaying body left a nasty stain on the ward's floor that can still be seen today. And in our number one spot, we have Waverly Hills Sanatorium. Located in Kentucky, this hospital was originally built in 1910 as a hospital for patients with tuberculosis. Sadly, tons of patients ended up dying from the disease. The hospital did more harm than good. Rumor goes that the hospital was mistreating their patients and conducting experiments on them. In fact, they had an area in the hospital called the death tunnel or body shoot where they would dump the deceased. It's also said that one nurse hung herself in room 502 and in that same room, another nurse died from falling out of the window. The hospital closed in 1961 upon the discovery of an antibiotic that could treat and cure tuberculosis. As a result, there was no need for the hospital. Now it's said that it's an extremely haunted building. Apparently, people have seen tons of apparitions there. The most famous one being of a boy named Timmy, 
who likes to play with rubber balls. He also likes to run from room to room. It's said that if you roll a small ball down a hallway, then Timmy will roll it back to you. Also, why are all ghosts either named like Timmy or Tommy? That's what I need to know. Starting us off at number 10 is the Aradale Mental Hospital. This is an Australian psychiatric hospital. Patients got there in 1865 and it was closed in 1998. Electroconvulsive therapy and transorbital lobotomies were common practice, which not even children were excluded from. It was explored by John and Deb Christopher of the Drifter Paranormal Investigative Team and they experienced a lot they couldn't explain. They went in with a ton of equipment and they encountered what they believed to be a friendly child ghost or specter that set off their K2 EMF meters in sequence. It was as if the ghost was running past them. Now they said the feeling in that room was lovely like a playing feeling because of the ghosts or spirits that were there, but that was their nicest encounter of the time there. They heard other sounds and wheezing, whistling noises and the sound of furniture being dragged, but as John said, there is no bloody furniture there. So the pair physically saw some cell doors moving and other things and got a bit of a creepy feeling. And they said yes, it was a windy night, so maybe that could be the doors, but they were in the middle of the building and hadn't noticed any drafts. So if you want to test out that location yourself, there are paranormal tours on most weekends. So maybe give it a try. At number 9 is another Australian asylum, Beechworth Lunatic Asylum. So we have talked about this place before, but that's because it's worthy of so many of our lists. A lot goes on there. It's haunted by many ghosts, including a specter that people have seen lying on the ground below a window. That woman specter was pushed out the window because another patient wanted her cigarettes. Now one of the scariest sections of this asylum is the area that practice electroshock therapy. Visitors of the area today say that area is colder than others. Now this could be because of the haunting idea of the practices that that occurred there, or it could be because the ghosts of the people who died in the asylum linger there in hopes of escaping their past pain. Other visitors have heard sounds of children laughing and playing, and one woman went with her son and saw him talking to himself. Her son said he was talking to a boy named James who lived in the asylum, but there was no one there. Little unsettling, but hopefully it was a nice conversation, you know? Hopefully. On to number 8. Pool Park in Wales. Now this building in Wales was used for many different things, but one use was an asylum. The gothic inspired architecture only adds to the creepy effect this abandoned building has. And while it may transition into another building, that hasn't stopped many from exploring its sites while they can. Jason Griffiths of a group called the Ouija Brothers saw his friend attacked by an aggressive spirit and possibly even possessed here. He wasn't even surprised at the time. He said, there's a very dark, heavy presence at Pool Park and if you don't listen to it and pay it attention, it makes itself known. You can feel when he's near, the surrounding energy becomes heavy. Now it's a very active site in terms of the unknown and paranormal, with people having their shirts tugged by mysterious forces, to seeing figures in windows of empty rooms. At number 7 is Eloise Hospital. In its busy days, over 12,000 patients lived there. It was nearly its own city, pretty much. It had a lot to provide for them. Now, when people have explored it nowadays, they have heard moans, roars, and screams on the grounds of the old psychiatric hospital. An employee reported that children saw a figure he couldn't see, and that the buildings had strange shadows. The basement of this building is especially creepy, as it was flooded by water for many years and wasn't explored for a very long time. When it was explored by a group called Detroit Paranormal Expeditions, they described their experience as eerie. They heard shuffling noises as if some of the old resident spirits remained, and Although it undergoes transformation into a mixed-use residential complex, it is assumed that the spirits haunting the area still remain and their emotional energies are lingering there. Let's move on to number 6, Namella Sanatorium in Finland. Now this was built as a tuberculosis sanatorium and was replaced with a mental hospital in 1932. The mental hospital was shut down in 1989 and since then, local rumors have spread of sightings in the hospital. The local lore talks about two different legends in addition to mysterious lights showing up in the building. The first legend is that the hospital is haunted by a spirit of a young girl who died there. She causes cold drafts, lights to flicker, and taps on the shoulders of people as if it's a playful game. Now, the second legend is that an apparition appears on the roof. It looks like a woman, and then she jumps off, causing onlookers to panic. But when they get to her to help, she's disappeared. But let's not hold on any longer, let's jump to number five. We have Trans Alangi Lunatic Asylum. Now, this asylum opened up in 1864 and was built to house 250 people for treatment, but it swelled up to almost 2,400 people in the 1950s. The asylum even offered money to anyone who dropped off a patient, which obviously led to people who shouldn't have been admitted to be admitted. Now, the spirits of the asylum range in their stories. There was a little girl named Lily who was born in the asylum, a man named Jesse who died of a heart attack in a bathtub, some civil war stories, and one story of a patient who was brutally murdered by his roommates. 
allegedly. Now, the ghosts in here are known to turn lights on and off, some like cigarettes, and this location is an asylum you can tour for yourself, as they now charge for historical and paranormal tours. You can even stay overnight, but you can't sleep there. <laughs> Let's move on to number four, Bethlehem Royal Hospital, aka Bedlam Asylum. The term Bedlam, meaning a scene of uproar and confusion, or chaos, or madness, came from this place. Bethlehem. Bedlam. And it's understandable how the term came from this place once you look at its history. It used to be a psychiatric institution in London that began in the 1400s, way back, and patients were locked up in chains and the treatments used on them bordered on torture. The residents of the areas surrounding the hospital complained about the sounds of cryings, screechings, roarings, brawlings, shaking of chains, swearings, frettings, and chafings. So the ghosts don't just haunt the Royal Hospital, but also Liverpool Station, since the station was built over the cemetery of the facility back in 1874. In the late 18th century, screams were heard in the area, and back in 2000, a ghost was recorded on closed circuit TV at the station. So the ghosts, all over London at that point. Just cause of that one place. Total bedlam. At number three is Gondium Psychiatric Hospital. Now this hospital has so many legends that there's even a movie based on it. It's known as one of the most haunted places in South Korea. It was demolished in 2018, but that wasn't before many teams explored it after hearing all of the legends. It is said that it closed suddenly in the 90s due to an overwhelming amount of patient deaths. There were stories of mad doctors gone insane and doing experiments on the patients. The more logical reason that went around as a rumor to explain the closure was that it was no longer up to code. Either way, strange happenings were recorded by those who went there and explored. There were doors opening on their own, warnings not to go into room 402, glass shards being thrown across hallways, and demons scratching visitors. All of that, you name it. Now, Gondium didn't get its reputation for nothing. There are also rumors of shadows, voices, moans, and screams, but I guess that's typical in all the scary places. Not fun. But let's go on to number two, Letworth Village. Letworth Village was a residential institution that opened in 1911. Now it is overtaken by nature as it has been just left to be. People who walk among the buildings report feeling overwhelming sadness. Visitors also report hearing furniture scraping across floors in the buildings, heavy footsteps, disembodied whispers, and tapping, knocking, and rapping on the peeling stained walls. So similar to other paranormal places, there are rooms that become suddenly cold, but there is just so much paranormal activity at Letchworth. There are possible poltergeists that fling belongings and turn lights on and off. Plus, people record a lot of EVP phenomena. Now the scariest thing a group reported was that they came across a seven foot tall apparition with its legs bent back. It stalked towards them with glowing white eyes. If I saw that, I don't know what I would do. Probably run away very quickly. And others have felt pushed, shoved, or held down by mysterious forces while exploring. So if you decide to check it out, be warned. There's a lot. But let's go on to our number one, Poveglia Island. So this island is known for a lot of supernatural happenings, but there was a large mental hospital on the island that ran from 1922 to 1968. There's a legend that one mental health doctor there tortured, butchered, and ate many of the patients. Now, this is allegedly before he went mad and jumped to his death from the bell tower, but I would argue that he was probably mad before that if he was eating patients. Now, the legend states that it wasn't the fall that actually killed him when he jumped from the tower, but a mist that came up from the ground and strangled him. Now, the ruins of the hospital remain on the island to this day, but it is now illegal to step foot on the island. This is due to the number of haunted happenings that go on there. Now, there's said to be many plague spirits on the island from the number of bodies dumped there during the plague, as well as the spirits of those harmed by the doctor from the mental hospital. Mm -hmm. 